Yes, I hope the image is bigger and clear, right? Yes. Okay, so can I, Hannah, can you see and let me know what do you understand from this picture? Is anything clear to you? Um, yeah, sir. Sort of. Yeah. There are what? so many, uh, so many how to say, uh, like, uh, homo species, like, homo has the three things and all those things are like, we are not learned, we didn't learn, like, homo rudolfensis and homo aquarius. Those are things. Homo Homo rudolfensis is habilis only, ergaster is erectus, they are the other names. Okay, okay. So what can you understand from the graphs? Can you, can you explain the graph? This graph I have taken from Encyclopedia Britannica. It's the website. Online, online source. Uh, so, yeah. Let's go with what do you understand? Like, um, over time, the skull structure has become more, how to say, uh, more than outward, it has gone inward and, you know, compressed, I guess. No. It has got outward, actually. How so? What, what are you saying? What, which, what are you talking about? Um, this is for the brain capacity. You're talking about the face, right? Yeah, sir. And the, the teeth uh, and all those things. Uh... You're looking at the wrong thing. Look at the head, the brain. This is this. Read always whenever you read the graph, read the y and the x axis. The y axis is millions of years, time frame in years. The x axis is brain capacity in cubic centimeters. So, here, when we read the x axis, it's increasing in this order, right? The y axis is increasing in this order. So, it's decreasing. Y axis is increasing. This is zero millions years ago, which means this is present. This is where we are currently. And this is 4 million years ago. OK, is it clear, everyone? And the way we read a graph is what the graph is trying to tell. So first, you see these green things, right? These green bars. So they start as early as somewhere near 3.8 or 4 million years ago and touch till the present, right here. Is it clear? Now, <clears throat> if we try to understand on x-axis is the brain capacity in cubic centimeters. Now, Australopithecus, which I told you about Australopithecus africans and Australopithecus cari. These are two Australopithecus subspecies. Australopithecus, again, is the genus here. And what you see in colored, like in golden or brown, you can say, is the part of the skull that we have found in fossils. What is in black or gray is the missing part that we have reconstructed on the basis of the parts that we have found. Where, how does it fit the best? So if you see, as we go, as we come towards the modern you know, humans, the skull samples, of course, Homo sapiens are the most advanced. So this is Homo sapiens, and this is the Homo sapiens skull, this one. And if you see, this is the Australopithecus skull. Now, between this skull and this skull, you will see a lot of lot of changes. First of all, this, if you see, this is our eyebrow, right? Here is the eyebrow, like the crown. And this region, which I'm marking here in blue, is the cranial capacity. This is the size of the brain. So as compared to the face, you see that the brain is quite big, right? Yes, no, something. Yes, sir. Yes. So through this, you can understand that what we were, what I was talking about in terms of brain size and human evolution, and how do we know? So this is not just about humans. It is about a uh, close, closely related species as well, like gorilla and chimpanzees have been given as um, to measure, like to quantitatively measure things. So if you look here, carefully, look at this chimpanzee. Now I'm again outlining. So this is the eyebrow. I'm outlining the brain, cranial capacity, right? So this is the cranial capacity of chimpanzee, which is outlined in blue. Can you see this, everyone? 
and this is the, the outline for human if you can see here now you tell me with respect to the rest of the face and this is the rest of the face here yeah, this is the rest of the face humans have a bigger cranial capacity correct yes if you look at a gorilla it's even primitive because this is the brain capacity with respect to this face whom do you think is the biggest cranial capacity uh so homo sapiens homo sapiens right so that's why chimpanzee being very close to us still cannot match us in terms of you know the abilities or our brain size okay but they are very very advanced as compared to australopithecus now look at australopithecus if you see australopithecus now this is not the brain size this this part is for the temporal where your lobe is so brain is somewhere in this region only right because yes. their face was protruding right side this teeth you can see it was protruding out like many cattles then australopithecus african uh, africanus which means that developed in africa gari and boise these are and robustus and afarensis so all these this 1 2 3 4 and 5 they are all australopithecus species Uh, one thing that you will, you will see same in australopithecus species is that their face is protruding very out this teeth right but still there are subtle changes in all correct yes or no yes yes then we come to homo habilis habilis and rudolfensis is another different subtype of habilis so you see now the face is slightly in and the cranial capacity has increased right as compared to this or this right yes yes as we go towards ergaster the face is even in but can you see this prominent this thing eyebrow where the eyebrow is this this is called crown can you see this prominent crown above the eye humans yes, don't sir. have it we don't have it it's missing in humans if i remove this see it clearly can you see there is no crown in human yes sir yeah but there was a crown in heidelbergensis more in neanderthals even more in raptors and in ergaster that these are subtle certain subtle differences between but if you compare homo heidelbergensis with homo sapiens or homo neanderthal with homo sapiens these three look the most recent right in terms of cranial capacity as well as the 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 shape of their so this one this one and this one can you see that they are very very comparatively similar yes you may be finding it diff different because in humans they also have put the lower jaw imagine without the lower jaw because here the lower jaw was missing right so we do not have the lower jaw for these samples but if you imagine a lower jaw it will look something like this very very similar right Yes. correct yeah. yes and also the cranial capacity is very big so the brain de development is very big so and these green lines show you the range in the time period where they were present so first was australopithecus they stayed for quite a very long time there were many different species of australopithecus as a genus 1 2 3 4 5 of which we know about okay so australopithecus and dromopithecus did i tell you sorry uh, Uh, dryopithecus and dromopithecus developed into australopithecus one of the which which uh, branch diverged into australopithecus dry or dryopithecus or dromopithecus dromopithecus yes theek okay. hai the the dryopithecus branch went on to become these things later on about which they have not shown anything but they have just shown that they are present together gorilla and chimpanzee okay yes sir so this shows that australopithecus stayed for quite a very long time and if you see the homo species was also present along with australopithecus it they diverged right and also these overlapping timelines show that many species of homo sapiens were present at the same time so when homo sapiens this is for homo sapiens can you see and this is for neanderthal and this is for hydelbergensis 
So if you see, there is slight overlapping here and slight overlapping, lot of overlapping here as well. You understand? So these three yes, species, sir. one, two, and three, supposed to, and also this one, see, erectus is also till here, right? This four. Yes. So these four species, which I'm marking, were present, most likely, at the same time. So at, the, at one point of time, there were around four homo species and these are not the only four we have also find devsonian so homo devsonian and homo one more i am forgetting the name these two were also present the evidences suggest that they were present devsonians were for sure present and we know that by other so this is not the only record only evidence to prove that many species of humans were present at the same time on the earth others other comes from dna so you know when these fossils are found, their teeth, this the teeth contains DNA. It, it can have preserved DNA. So you can take DNA out from the teeth, do the DNA, thing, uh, DNA sequencing. And we have also seen that some parts of Neanderthal DNA or Devsonian DNA for that matter is now present in Homo sapien DNA. So how do you think that DNA got exchanged? So it mutated, I guess. So if it mutates, a DNA of Neanderthal cannot come into a DNA of human, no? With mutation. So with mutation, something changes in our own DNA. How can we get someone else's DNA? If you, it's like, can you take someone else's apple just by mutating your apple? No. What do you have to do to take someone else's apple? We have to take our apple. We have to? Finish our yeah, but we cannot finish our DNA. Oh. How do DNAs get exchanged? Very simple. There's Is only one way to exchange DNA. Sexual DNA. Sir? Exactly. Oh. So it's not a very difficult guess to make that all these different species were so similar. They were living in uh, close niches together and at times they were also reproducing among each other. So the definition, by definition, these species were not very, very different genetically. So they could actually reproduce and they could also form fertile offsprings. Now that's interesting because many species still can do that. Okay. In nature, they are not, they are not, um, they, they do not normally prefer doing that, but some species can do that if they do not find um, mates. And the fact that Neanderthal's DNA or, or Devsonian's DNA is present in human DNA, fragments of it, it proves that DNA exchange, exchange of genetic material has happened. It might also have happened through, uh, it's not always through sexual reproduction, it might also have happened through infections, viral infections. The idea is one virus that was also creating problem in Neanderthals went into the Neanderthal DNA and while infecting it, got some part of that DNA out. And when it infected Homo sapiens in a, in a pandemic, in a disease or an epidemic, then it transferred that DNA to us. But that's very, it's not very, very common, but sexual reproduction is very common. And that would be the first possibility. Second could be viral infections. Now, to figure out whether they could sexually reproduce, we had to, also, we had to prove that they are found. First of all, both these kind of fossils, all these different human fossils are found from the same niche because it's obvious. A Homo sapien, if it is living in, uh, let's say, the Indian region of current Asia, will not go to China to just reproduce and come back, right? You will see them living close together. Yes or no? So those evidences, those fossil records also have been found and suggests that Yes, they were actually in very closed cultural ties among themselves. Unfortunately, now, you know, we are just the only homo species. I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate, but we are the only homo species surviving. But we are as good as, as they were many because we are still quarreling and fighting among each other in the name of religion, country, caste, creed, race, etc. So we are no better. Anyways.
but they were also doing the same thing they were at constant conflict for niche for nutrition for the same hunting grounds for the same caves to live in and that's how they um one of the four or five which is homo sapiens outlived or outcompeted others is it clear yes everyone yes. so now is it uh, is this so by this graph you understand so you if you like you would like you can take the screenshot of this graph everyone yes sir or else or i'll send this i'll send this picture on the group okay okay sir okay very well so with this uh, is human uh, evolution clear to you do you have any doubts regarding human evolution any other thing any other proofs any other doubts that makes you still not believe in it then we can go forward and look for other things scientific so any have any you heard of the sir have you heard of the platypus have i heard of the platypus yes sir duck billed platypus right yes sir that would exist yes yeah what about that no sir yeah i read about it someone apparently it, it's like a very like um, like a very curious case of evolution like actually when scientists yes, i, I like to read yes. the page that when scientists saw it for the first time they thought it was like a fake it was like that you were know, like yeah, not you were like duck bill platypus yeah. yes duck bill platypus has a bill you know it does not have it's a mammal first of all so you should know that it's a mammal but it's the only egg laying mammal okay and it's it's found in australia and, and Tas tasmania i believe if i'm not wrong but like i don't know if it it has been introduced to other parts of the world but natively it's from there and its evolution is so different it has bill like a like a bird or a duck that's why it's called duck billed it has a bill like a duck and platypus because it's flat it it when it's swimming it almost look flat but it's a mammal okay and it has uh, um, hands with the webs like a duck so it's so evolved for aquatic life that it even does not look mammal first of all and second it does not behave like mammal it lays egg but then why do we call it as mammal it is so different that we have actually when you in the taxonomy it is the sole member of its family and genus so there is no other species like duck billed platypus on earth that is a mammal and have adapted for water so much that uh, nothing found like this but but then how do why do we call it mammal simple mammal the word mammal comes from what what is the one feature that every mammal has whether it is whale or duck billed platypus or human or cows or buffaloes or cats or dogs what is that feature or mouse the word mammal comes from mammary glands okay am i audible to all of you yes, yes sir is speaking okay so the word mammal comes from mammary glands and those which produce milk for their young ones is are called mammals and uh, who have uh, hair or fur like coat or a fur on the skin which is made up of hair so these two features are present in duckbill platypus no other organism apart from mammals can produce milk in mammary glands that's where the word mammal comes from they have mammary glands yes you are right duckbill platypus is a very very different kind of evolution one of its kind it's believed that there were there were different species of duckbill platypus and duckbill platypus if you if you see something like it's something like us right we are the only species in our genus but not in the family i think i'm not sure about if humans share the family with someone else but till genus we are the only homo sapiens other homos are dead gone Yes. Okay. Any other question? Does that does, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Very well. Okay. So if there is no question, anyone has any other question with respect to human evolution, this graph or anything? So still, will it be yeah. asked in the exams like oh. their names? Only the names which are in your NCERT will be asked. Sure.
Okay, so let's start with the new chapter today, which is human health and diseases, right? This is the next chapter, correct? Yes. Okay. So before we move forward to start something in depth, some concepts in depth, tell me what do we mean by human health? Is the, is the concept of human health? So there are two terms. Health, the first term and diseases. So let's first go to health. What is a health? How will you define health? Anyone? It is like, um, like, like, I think you could say state of well-being, yeah. like a state where all the, all the organs are like working. Just the organs are working. So you mean well-being with respect to the organs. What if all organs, so if my, if some persons, all the organs are working fine, that person is healthy. So it's the proper condition of the health. What do we mean by proper condition of the health? It's as, is as ambiguous as health itself. Oh, yeah, like proper condition of the human, like, you know, whether they are fine or not. See, I know. You have, you have to explain what you know. Okay. Yes, you, you're going in the right direction, I believe. So proper condition, just, just elaborate that those two adjectives. What do you mean by proper condition of health? Um, Quite but what do you think? What do you think? It's not about, if you're not sure, it's okay. Even if you're wrong, it's okay. But if you're not speaking, you're not attempting at all, that's not okay. Yeah, so proper condition of health. Yes, what do you mean by that? So if you are physically and mentally uh, uh, fit, then we can see we are healthy. Yeah, so he introduced one more factor, physically and mentally. What do we mean by physically and mentally fit? What is physical fitness and mental fitness, Zed? So if, uh, if someone is uh, able to do work uh, on his own uh, mm -hmm. and he can control his body uh, uh, in, uh, so maybe it's a physical fitness according to me. Diabetic patients can work on their own and even can control their body. Uh, yeah. If you have a, if you have fever, you are weak, but let's say if you have a running nose, you can still work on your own and you can control your body. It's not like you lose control of your body. So? Yes. Uh, I don't know whether it's right, but like, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it is, so uh, thinking is important. You don't have to worry if it's right or wrong that eventually all of you, why are you, why are you in this class? So that you know what's right, right? Simple. Mm -hmm. So you get to know what's happening, what I, why, are we, why are we studying this subject, what is correct in this subject, what's not. So you, you trust me for that. So don't worry about that. Okay. You're paying for you. It's, you're paying for it. It's your right to know what's right. You have to just tell me, what do you know? Because unless and until you do that, you will never be able to come out of the shell of that inhibition to not answer in a class. You have to answer. At worst, the answer will be wrong. You know, Einstein was wrong at many instances. Stephen Hawking was wrong. He even proved himself wrong. So he proved something, then he disproved the same thing saying that, oh, I was wrong. This is right. So there's no shame in being wrong in science. If you're not wrong, you will never be right. Because you do not understand what is the difference between wrong and right. So tell me, Anna, what do you think? Uh, so the immunity, uh, are born, like the immunity to um, fight. Immunity to? Against, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, disease, disease causing cells. Okay. Okay. Then? Prevents it from us getting ill. That's right. Immunity protects us from getting ill. That's right. But how are you relating it in the concept of health? Do you mean to say that? Yeah, people, how, with, uh, hmm. people having proper health will have high immunity. People who have 
good working immunity and are do not have any kind of disease are healthy yeah okay so that is physical health or mental health so that's physical health then what's mental health so mental health is like uh, you can hmm. Yes, mental health is a very, very hot topic these days. We should, we all are listening, hearing about these things, about mental health issues. But the sad part is we do not even understand what's health. Forget about physical or mental health. What is mental health? Is it something different from physical health? Yeah, can we... it can be different. But like there's a wide option to it. No? What is that wide, wide, wide option? Um, like, do you want, um, is it like uh, um, a depression and all? Okay, that's a mental health. Okay, but like. Exactly. That's a mental health issue. That's yeah. mental yeah. illness. Yeah. Depression is when the mental health fails. It's yeah. just like an infection. So when your physical health fails, you have an infection in the body or a disease in the body or a disorder in the body. When your mental health fails, you have depression, anxiety. You have um, other um, anxiety and depression and stress-related issues. Yes. But how will you define it? Yes. Continue. Um, the, so how is depression different from um, an infection about from physical health? This is you were telling that there is some difference between physical health and mental health. Yes. Yeah, so the physical health, uh, like... Um, for mental health, you might be physically all right, but mentally you won't be all right. That holds true for physical health. For physical health, you might be mentally all right, but physically not well. Yeah. So what's the difference? It is just the similarity you're talking about. Okay. You started by saying that they are different, right? Yeah. For, yeah. Even if you have, uh, how to say, a mental issue, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not compulsory that you're supposed to be physically, how to say, poor in health. Right. The same goes for physical health. If you are suffering from a physical disease, you're not supposed to be in mentally in problem or peril. That is impossible, sir. Almost all of them might be suffering from something or the other. Either it's nervousness or anxiety. Either one of them, one I guarantee that. So even uh, flu or running cold is physical health failing. So do when you have cold, are you mentally also not well? So it's kind of interconnected right now. So that's what I'm asking. So if if I am if I have a running nose, let's say. Okay. So will my mental health also suffer if I have let's say um, um, that diarrhea? I have loose motions. So mentally also I am suffering then? Yes. Yes? Yeah. How? Um, you feel constant, uh, how to say, pressure like this? Constant pressure you also feel when you give exams. So you are, you are mentally ill when you are giving exam. Mm. On the morning of exam, you all are very anxious, aren't you? If I start taking a viva, you suddenly will be very anxious. So the moment I start Viva or the moment uh, you go into an exam or the moment India plays against Pakistan, the player are mentally ill now because they are under a lot of pressure. Like I've seen, you know, people during COVID time, uh, mm -hmm. their health increasing is based on their, uh, the way they think. Yeah, that's to not let your mental health also fall under the bus if your physical health is affected. That's, that's a different thing. Like to protect your mental health. which And the whole point of doing that is to prove that mental health can be protected even if you are physically not doing good. Mm -hmm. There are many disorders like genetic disorders. Those are physical health issues. So someone with color blindness is physically not fit. But does color blindness cause mental health issues as well? Very from person to person. Yeah, but... How can color blindness cause you? Because you are you will not get to know about color blindness until you go for a color test. It's not like the moment you got to know oh, I'm color blind, you will be now mentally ill as well, right? Mm. So, so so that's the point. If you're talking about pressure and anxiety, 
it's all we all go through it it's all there in the body correct and the problem is that we do not understand so to in this in this chapter there will be two things that we will be aiming at to understand the physical health related issues immunity some diseases like cancer some substance abuse including drugs and alcohol aids etc so we will also read about some common diseases but one thing that no school no college teaches you is about mental health that's a very important aspect of health and it's getting more and more important by every passing day in today's world right because there are a lot of things that people are going through that might not affect them physically but might affect them mentally okay and people are not yet so they are very ignorant about mental health some people do not even accept mental health issue as an issue it's like you are just overthinking you know come on get up be happy it's all right you never go to a cancer patient and say come on get up be happy it's fine tomorrow your cancer cells are going to die but you might end up saying that to a to a depressed person to a person who locks himself in the room and behaves erratic so we are like he is just you know pretending no one can pretend to be depressed for that matter you know because we do not understand the underlying principle of it because we are not taught about it in ncert in class 11th and 12th so that we can understand it is as equal a disorder as cancer or any other diabetes or any other genetic disorder is so there are reasons for mental health issues it's not just so and we use the term very loosely you know so the term like stress depression anxiousness we use it so loosely have you ever seen someone using term like um, cancer diabetes very loosely so if someone has a headache do they end up saying oh yesterday i had a very ba- bad brain tumor you know today i am feel well okay. but you will hear people saying that oh i was very depressed but today i feel good you know i am very stressed i got a severe anxiety today i feel good so the the boundary between physical and mental health well being and disordered condition is very bleak because we as a society have made it bleak in mental we'll go to the physical health part but let me just clarify the mental health thing for you and also like culturally also there is i have seen many people being ignorant about mental health saying that you know if you just believe in yourself and believe in your creator just be just you know just be uh, wake up in the morning do your routine thing nothing can beat you you know nothing is beyond x y z so you should not be depressed but the same thing no one it will make no sense if someone goes and says are just you know believe in the creator and believe in yourself you will never get diabetes does not make sense right we all know that we all can get diabetes due to many factors I, if we are genetically hardwired to have diabetes if it's running in the family nothing can prevent us from being diabetic if we have a color blindness gene we are going to be color blind no matter what so because these things can be quantified and have been quantified all the way into medical history so we are more serious about it but using terms like depression anxiety and uh, stress we are very loose about it so we do not we do not understand we are not sensitive about people who are actually suffering from it so there are something called neurotransmitters there are chemicals which are secreted by the brain hormones and uh, which act as hormones and neurotransmitters which actually helps in relaying signal between one and the other neuron which makes the brain which keeps the brain in a properly functional way two of them are dopamine and serotonin and if the levels of dopamine and serotonin is affected you know if there is no le- serotonin or no dopamine in the body then brain does not behave in a proper manner brain so all these diseases just like what is diabetes tell me let's draw parallels to understand what is diabetes is it something that comes out from outside and causes a disease i can understand that covid comes out of our body and starts so infection always comes from outside right so we we are serious about it though many people are not even serious about covid they believe that okay covid is just a hoax but Uh, we cannot do anything about those people 
but I can understand that infection comes from outside. But what about diabetes? What is diabetes? What happens in diabetes? Because that is one of the diseases that you have to study insulin and glucagon. So just let's discuss this. Yes, what is diabetes? The blood sugar level is high. Why? The blood sugar level is high. Okay, one statement is that. So that's diabetes. If the blood sugar level is high, that's diabetes, which means every morning when you have breakfast, you have a diabetes for two hours, right? So we all are diabetic for two, three hours. After every breakfast, we do. Because it's breaking the fast. That's why it's called breakfast. You have been sleeping. So throughout the night, you are utilizing sugar, glucose in the body. So your glucose reserves start going down. Then you wake up and the first meal that you have pumps lots of sugar in your blood. So you are diabetic. Correct, Atif? No, sir. No. So according to your definition, we all are diabetic in the morning and before we go to bed, these three hours before going to bed and three hours after the breakfast, we all should be diabetic because blood sugar level is very high in the body. So what is diabetes? What is the problem with high blood sugar? It's a common thing, it happens normally and that's, that's how we have to understand diseases. So if you respect diabetes as a disease, you will also respect depression or anxiety as a disease because in a diabetes, the problem is not that blood sugar level goes high. It keeps fluctuating, through, fluctuating throughout the day. That's why you must have heard if doctors are asking you to go for a, a glucose test, they always tell you that come either empty stomach or don't, don't eat anything uh, half an hour or one hour before the test, right? Come empty stomach, give your blood sample, then you eat. So fasting glucose is taken to understand whether a person, how the person is metabolizing glucose. Yes or no? Because it's very clear that after the breakfast, everyone will have a very high glucose level for the next two, three hours. Because glucose goes up, we are absorbing lots and lots of glucose from our food. That is not the problem. The problem is there is also an enzyme in our body uh, known as insulin. Sorry, oh hormone, uh, a protein in our body known as insulin, right? Not an enzyme, but a, a hormone. What does insulin do? Insulin, any idea what does insulin do? So it controls the sugar level in our body. Plus. How? Uh, sugar level is not like a traffic, which insulin stands in the center of the blood road and controls. You go left, you go right. Some chemical, you know, um, from chemical what? From chemical, uh, how to say, cancelling is the, the same like Cancelling. So if insulin, you produce insulin, it will go and kill all the glucose. Uh, like not kill, it turns, like it changes Degrades. to, you know, uh, energy or something. So to change glucose, uh, insulin cannot, it's, it's not an enzyme. It's a hormone. A hormone cannot change anything. That is, not, that is not what is doing meta, uh, met, uh, metabolism. So that's where we know things, but we do not understand those things. That's where the gap in the knowledge comes. You know, there's a very wise quotation. It said that half knowledge is more dangerous than no knowledge at all. So those who have no knowledge can still be very humble, you know, knowing because I don't know about it. So what should I say? I have no opinion. Okay. But those who have half knowledge might end up having a wrong opinion about certain things. So whenever you, have you never thought what happens in diabetes? I'm sure that every one of you might know someone who's suffering from diabetes. Am I, am I wrong? Anyone who knows no one suffering from diabetes? Then either you need to expand your circle or you are just not asking people about how they are doing, what you just know about. You just don't know about people around you. Am I correct that everyone at least knows someone who have diabetes, who is suffering from diabetes? Yes, sir. Yep, Atif does. So what happens is insulin is a signaling molecule. Whenever the level of glucose rises in the blood, it is secreted by the pancreas by the action, by the command of the, of the brain that 
see there's lots and lots of uh, glucose in the blood so you better come and tell every cell to start taking glucose in so glucose is just in the blood so insulin comes up in the blood and then goes to each and every cell wherever the blood goes and tells knocks the door says hello there is lots of glucose please take the glucose in so only insulin can tell that to the cell then cells will start taking glucose in and once it is inside the cell it is not a problem at all for us diabetes is the condition when glucose cannot enter the cells but stays in the blood now that's a problematic situation it has to enter into the cell so that cell can put it into glycolytic pathway and start metabolizing it so one glucose break down into two molecules of pyruvate and give two atps that you have studied in class 11th in the chapter respiration but you forgot all together so congratulations go back and revise it okay people you understand what i'm trying to say these are the fundamental basics you should know so insulin actually regulates the blood glucose level by directing them to go into the cells if insulin is not produced they stay in the blood now that's an issue so that's called diabetes not the increasing of blood sugar is diabetes but unable to metabolize it in the cells or get uh, get it into the cells is the disease you understand everyone so the same reason which causes disease diabetes is present in all of us we all have blood sugar level we and all our blood sugar level goes up and down you know if you had too much of sweets your sugar level will increase the next hour but if you are normal not diseased insulin will also be produced in proper amount and as much as needed so if you ate one sweet you will have let's say 10 units of insulin required they it will be produced if you ate 10 sweets then there is lots of glucose you need 10 units of insulin and that will also be produced but in a diseased person it's unable to produce insulin so you understood where is the problem yes very good now let's go to a mental health issue let's say you know severe severe anxiety disorder now what is anxiety anxiety is just an emotion right it's an emotion where you feel very anxious and your heart beat increases that happens multiple times in our life before examination everyone is anxious but they are not going through a severe anxiety disorder so there's a difference between a person suffering from anxiety just like there's a difference between a person suffering from diabetes and a person whose blood glucose level just went up because after a breakfast so every morning before an important match before a presentation before anything that which is important to us and we have to perform there is a positive anxiety in all of us right but that's a feeling it should arise it should and why do these feelings come up why does anxious feeling comes up or why does you know the the fly fear of fear feeling comes we all are scared right but if someone is consistently scared it means there is a problem you understand so yes, all sir. these feeling helps us to modulate our responses towards some stimulus if the pro if someone does not feels anxious at all like not a single increase in heartbeat then the, either the person is very trained you know calm and composed or the person does not cares about what's happening so before an important examination before your final boards if you are not anxious there is a problem with you you know you have to be anxious so that your mind stays alert you know your heart beats faster lots of oxygen is circulated so your mind gets all that oxygen and you stay alert and you perform better okay that's why we are anxious but after the exam is done or once you started writing it and you are comfortable you know that okay i'm doing good that should go that should dilute that feeling should go just like your blood glucose level rose and after 3 4 hours when you metabolize that glucose it goes down so that's a normal state the problem occurs when certain players that regulate your anxiety you know all it is arising from the brain it's a feeling it's an emotion so that emotion is arising from the brain but the players just like insulin in this case it is serotonin let's say so serotonin has to be um, present let's say your brain stopped making serotonin because of some issues some problem that happened in the cells that produce serotonin serotonin serotonergic neurons they stop producing serotonin just like your islets um, sorry your um, cells of pancreas stop producing insulin then there will be less serotonin and now your 
motion of anxiety will not be tapered down, will not be controlled. You will feel anxious all the time. That's called a severe anxiety disorder where the panic attacks comes in. Even if you're sleeping, you're not sleeping well, you're getting nightmares, you're anxious all the time. If anyone asks you to, to, you, to, you to do something or meet someone, you, your heartbeat increases, you start feeling like I should close myself in the room. That is a disorder. But we never give it a due respect. We never take those people seriously. We means many people. We are insensitive towards people who need help. So we should not be. We should also not use this term very loosely. Why are you, why are you anxious? Yaar? It's okay, it's fine. Come, let's play. There are certain things we should... So someone might have told you that if someone has a cancer, you are visiting a person or someone died of cancer, you know, visiting their family. Some things that you will never say is, you will never say to a cancer patient, it's, it will be all right, you know. I also went through this. It, I, I understand it's bad. I, I came up. You will also do it. Come on, buck up, stand up. It's okay. Will you say that to a cancer patient? No, sir. You will also not say that, oh, shit, you had a cancer now, so there is no chance. You will also not say that. You will just try to be as normal and supporting and be present around there, right? You don't have to say either of those two. But at times, we end up saying to a person who's actually going through mental health issues, you know, okay, it's, hey, it's nothing. When you say it's nothing, you are demeaning what it is there because you don't know that just like diabetes, it is something. Just like cancer, where a gene got mutated and something happened in the body, here also something happened. So you are just nullifying everything that person is going through by saying, hey, it's nothing, just cheer up, come on. Let's go and watch a comedy movie. That's not how it works. And also the difference why we do not, uh, we are not sensitive, majority of society is not sensitive is because a person suffering from cancer, you know, is, is you know, we know that it's, it, it shows, it, you know that, you know, that cancer is permanent in the body. But the difference between mental and physical health, you know, that's what Hannah started with, is that if someone is depressed, they, they are not depressed 24 hours of the day. So people do not take it serious. If a person says that, you know, I'm, I'm suffering from severe anxiety disorder, and then you see that person the next day, you know, feeling happy with his cat or dog. Oh, today he's happy, which means he's fine. It does not work like that. Because a cancer patient can also be happy. That does not mean if the person is happy, enjoying a movie, enjoy with friends, he's now fine. Do you understand what I'm talking about, people? That's very important, actually. So be sensitive as humans first that we, we might not be knowing something. So always give that gray zone to people. Always give that gray zone of sympathy and empathy to people. You might not know everything that they're going through. So you ask them, how are you doing today? You just tell them that I'm here. You know, I'm just one call away. Just feel free to reach out to me. These things we should say to someone who needs help or someone who's in either in physical a disease or a mental disease. Okay. We should not differentiate between the two because the other is as big a problem as the, uh, the, the former one is. Mental health issues claims more lives than any disease in young people and it's it's a, it's proven these are records these are facts that people between the age of 16 to 30 die more of suicides or mental health related issues than they die of cancer and then they die of aids or any other diseases which are taken very seriously so this is a serious thing be very considerate because the whole reason uh, the whole reason you are studying science, you are studying human health, diseases, you are understanding genetics is that you understand life and you respect it. When you, when you read uh, reproductive system, the point was not to tell you about penis and vagina and ovaries and testes. That see, there are four organs which you know about it. The broader point was to put in your mind, let's see, there are two different type of bodies present in the biological system. But those bodies do not define personality all of all, like all together. So we are also very, 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 very insensitive towards the third gender, right? 
many of us do not accept we just we just think them as unnatural de devils or you know someone who is diseased that's not disease if you say that a sexual preference is a disease then any preference is a disease because it comes from the same thought process and the same limbic system in the mind if you prefer brinjal over okra or if you prefer biryani over um, let's say shirmal you are as ill as someone preferring male over female or female over male or vice versa or anything okay because these are preferences that arise from thoughts and human human humans are just like that so because a lot of then constraints comes from our theological thoughts our cultural thoughts our religious thoughts but we have to you know if you take an advice from me as science students we have to sometimes step up from what we believe we might be very insignificant in what we believe and without judging people we should you know respect them on their merit respect them being humans who have evolved the same as you who belong to your same species someone has written a question atif yes it's a good question atif are phobias considered a mental health issue yes they are more often so if the phobia we all have some inherent phobias some phobias are hardwired for example uh the fear of falling that's called i don't know what it's called but you know that we all are scared of falling that's a inbuilt thing you understand have you have it ever yes. have ever, ever happened to you that you are dreaming and in the dream you are falling and then you feel that fall you get scared and you wake up then you realize oh i was just on the bed happened yes sir yes so phobia is a normal emotion that is very important for our well being if you see a fire and you're like wow what a lovely fire let me go and embrace the fire then you're going to die so there has to be a inherent you know how do all animals are afraid of fire and that early cavemen realized so that they started keeping fire around their caves so that no tiger or lion can just enter and attack them because fear of fire is an inherent phobia you understand so there are this is also emotion but if it goes beyond a point that it terrifies you so if someone has a arachnophobia fear of spiders good that you brought it up good question atif so if there is a fear of spiders we all have some baseline fear of spiders unless and until we are trained to work with spiders you know it's not like if there is a spider so there are two behaviors so if you encounter a spider in your room atif what will you do we will then figure out whether you have a arachnophobia or not if you see that there is a spider in my room what will you do first response you will be a little scared right oh there is a spider versus if you if you find out if you find a 100 rupee 100 bucks note in your room you will behave very differently no you will not go towards the spider oh very cute spider right yes unless and until you are someone who's who's actually studying spiders and tomologist or arachnologist so that's where your fear will go after training so they can even hold the spider in the hand they even know which spider is um nasty which spider is neutral which spider is cool which can bite you which can not which is poisonous etc etc so that comes with experience that's a different thing that's training your mental training but you will not be dreaded to life right if you see a spider will you be atif you will just not go close that's very very logical thing to do because you don't know whether it can bite or not what it can do to you you will not like an infection happening so it's fine but will you be so dreadful that you will just choke and stop there and start sweating no sir no so you don't have a arachnophobia a phobia is the moment one hears or imagines or sees a spider their body just cannot tolerate that they just you know they just undergo a lot of fear they start it's the same thing like there is a if you give a mouse the smell of a fox or a cat or their urine they are terrified with their life because they know now i'm going to die there is a cat around which is so close to me i can smell its body smell or the urine smell i am gone so if if suddenly you are just wandering in a park and you see a tiger in front of you that will be something that's going to you know just 
right? But it's still not phobia. It is just the fear that's there because you know that your life is in danger now. But fear is, phobia is when you cannot control that feeling, just like anxiety, depression. So phobias are also considered as issues and they are treated as well. There is a therapy and to treat it, whatever you have a phobia for, they train you for that. That do not worry, it's just a spider. So they, the, the, the therapy starts like close your eyes, think about a spider. Then you will be like, no, 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 I'm scaring, I'm scaring. Okay, I'm here. Just open your eyes. Cool. Let's talk about something else. Again, let's do it. Close your eyes. Imagine a also, spider. Like even if uh, you were showing a photo of a particular... Yes. Uh, this one, they yeah. get really, uh, how to say, tensed up and afraid and they wouldn't want to continue the session. So they start up with uh, photos and then they start showing videos. They get very uncomfortable around those yes. type of sessions. Yes. So yeah. yeah it, but over time, they start getting more and more comfortable. Then comes the last stage where you have to touch a spider, a tarantula. Yeah. You know, some people would not like to go to that stage. They will be like, okay, now I'm not that dreadful. I'm not having a phobia, but I will not touch. That's their right. You know, it's okay. It's fine. Cool. If you wanted to get out of it and you got this much, it's 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 great. Because I don't have a uh, phobia of spider, but if someone just tell me, touch that spider, I will say, no, bro, I'm not going to touch it. You know? Because I also don't love the spider. Not not fearing does not mean I'm loving it. It I can just be neutral. I can maintain my distance. That's fine. But phobia is something that takes over, and you know it freezes you, and you are you are you, you just cannot. If you are driving and you see a spider, you might you know you might end up getting into an accident, you know, because you freeze. Your brain will just not. Yes, Hannah, you were saying something. Please, sorry, I interrupted. No, sir, like uh, the same thing, sir. I've seen like sessions in you know, where they try to remove a phobia, like uh, there's a person scared, like fear dogs so much. First, they bought like fur of uh, like the pictures and videos, and then they showed a fur of a dog and they would touch it. And then it was like that. And then they bought a small dog and then the bigger dogs. Right. So it goes in a series. That's what. Yeah. So, yes, Atif, good question. And that's also considered. So. So I hope that though we are not going to study much of it, but I wanted to spend some time on this topic as well, because I think, you know, for exams and all for entrances, we all will become good students of science. But what's more important, I, I believe, like it's my personal belief, my personal opinion, is that if you are studying science, we should also become good homo sapiens to begin with, right? informed sensitive homo sapiens towards certain things that have been found by science to matter to be significant okay everyone so i hope you will remember this and be more considerate if you are already very good if you are if you have never given it a thought please give it a thought if you see people around you behaving in that manner you know don't just don't just be in an argument, but try to change their opinions in the same way I'm trying because information leads to change in opinions if they realize, or if the person is open to receive that information as education, right? So it's always said in cultures as well that you, two things you cannot give a person by force. One is education and second is faith, right? Ilm or deen, they call it. So that has to be taken. Zed is asking, so what are allergies? Yes, Zed, we'll talk about allergies in this chapter as well, but just to give you the answer, allergies are just opposite of something being deficient. Allergy is a hyper response, a hyper exaggeration of your immune system. So if something enters your body, your immune system just know, okay, this is a pathogen, bring it, kill it, done. But instead, so it's just like uh, if, let's say, if one enemy enters your territory, what will you do, Zed? You are the king of a capital and one enemy on a horse entered your territory. Let's say 10 enemies entered your territory. What will you do? Will you start a war with those 10 people? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. So we can capture them. Uh... But you will not start a war, right? No, sir. Because, you know, 10 people are anyways not going to just burn down my whole territory. These are just 10 people, so I, let me capture them on equal force or double the size number of force. For 10 people, you will send 20 people, right? To be just sure. Will you see yes. an army of 10,000 to defeat 10 people? Uh, no, sir. No, it does not make sense, right? It's hyper-exaggeration. 
of your response. Yes or no? Yes. So as human also, we always calculate what response should we make. So if someone says you something and you become so mad that you're just yelling and throwing everything, it's hyper exaggeration. You, know, you, could have just, you could have just talked. Similarly, when some pathogen enters our body, our immune system has ways to suppress it, kill it, capture it without causing a lot of um, disturbance to the body. For example, if you get a bee sting, how many of you have got bee sting? Yes, sir, I got stung by a bee. So what happens? What happened to you there when you got a bee sting? Uh, so the area swells uh, and it kind of yeah. pains very where, uh, where, where did you get the bee sting? If you can say that. If you so want to share hand. that. And okay, so that local area got swelled, right? Yes. Anything else you observed? Uh, there was pus. And, uh, pus? Uh, I don't remember that much, but maybe. Yeah. When a bee stings, you do not get pus. It, I think it gets swollen, it gets red, yeah, it gets heated up, and it pains and itches. That's yes, all yes. I know. Pus is like when there's a bacterial infection. Bacteria causes, uh, like, forms pus. Right? Pus is where the wound has gone wrong. <laughs> there's a problem. The tissue is now dying. So, in uh, it's just localized, right? Some yes. people might get a fever after a bee sting. That's body's immune response working against toxins in the sting because sting has formic acid as an, as an irritant. So that can happen. But some people, when they are, if they're allergic to bee sting, if they got stung by the bee, it's not just localized redness or swelling. Their whole body, their eyes, you know, their chin and their body will have rashes and their eyes will puff out swollen. So there, there will be a whole level, full-fledged systemic response as if something very big has happened with your body. That's called hyper exaggeration. Some people have dust allergies and pollen allergies. So the moment dust will go into their nose or they will inhale some pollens, they will just start sneezing. The water will be running out. They'll start coughing. They'll get whole body fever and there'll be joint aches as well. So that's called allergy to that response. You understand? The heart rate will start rising. Yes. So that is allergy. Is it clear, Zan? We will study more about it okay. later on. Yeah. Okay. So enough of uh, like we, we talked a lot. I think you noted some things down. And yes, I was saying that uh, be a good, informed, educated, sensitive homo sapien who's studying science. Okay. Make a difference in society. Make a difference around yourself and make lives better with this knowledge. Don't just take or seek this knowledge for board exams believe me 10 years down the line you will know. i like i have I, had, I gave my board exams in and i think 2013 2013 yes and i do not remember you know i remember certain things but i don't care no one cares about my board exams now so it's, it's as insignificant but it was significant then because i had to get into good universities with good grades but in the long run, what kind of a person you are, what, what, what you utilize your knowledge for matters. And if you become that good seeker in science, then every exam of yours will be good. Because you are not ratifying, you are not memorizing or mugging up just for exams. Okay, very well. So let's come back to the topic of health as Zed and Hannah have described already. It's a combination of mental and physical well-being. We, we, I think we understand about the two now and we also understand the difference. Do we, Hannah and Zed? Yes. Hannah? Sir. Yes? Yes, sir. Yeah, very good. So write down what is health. Write down health is defined as health is defined as the overall well-being, the overall well-being of a human, the overall well-being of a human, which includes, which includes physical, mental, emotional and social well-being. So? Yes. 
doesn't emotional and social come in as a mental health though? No. Yes, I was just going to say that, but you good that you asked it. Mental health, I just explained you, can have very robust reasons. Just like diabetes cannot come under emotional and social, you know, because we know the reason for diabetes. It's not through. It's not. A, it's not in the emotional control. It's not in the social control. If society does not want you to be diabetic, you will not be diabetic. Does this sentence make sense? No. If my family does not want me to be depressed, I will not be depressed. Does that statement make sense? No. No. So that's where social well-being is different from mental well-being. Mental well-being can rise from our own problems, actual hormonal level problems or problems when coping up with certain personal losses or coping up with our own emotions in a good manner. You could have asked whether emotional and mental have a difference. That would have been a better question. But since you, social is very different. Social well-being means acceptance. So it might not, sorry, uh, come again. Uh, the what I meant was like men, if your mental health is low, your emotional and social uh, well-being. Of course, well. of course, of course. Yes, you are correct. For so that matter, you are also correct when you said that big problems, like if someone gets to know that they have uh, that person X Y Z is suffering from cancer all of a sudden. Of course, its emotional and mental health will go down as well, right? The person will not will be very scared, will keep crying, will not feel good about life, will be very, very depressed and anxious, right? Yes, sir. But every, in every physical disorder, in every physical uh, disease or health issue, it does not happen. That's where they are separated. In, in, in mental also, if someone is under, if someone is suffering from severe depression or anxiety from very long, it also starts affecting their physical health and other health. The fact that it has its own different cause makes it a different, brings it in a different bracket, mm -hmm. you know, and should be treated as such, equal. Now, coming to social well-being, social well-being means that you are, you are behaving well in the society, you are accepted well in the society. Suppose you are physically fit, you are a good, healthy person, all your organs are working, you are also mentally happy, you have accepted yourself, you know about yourself, you love life. But you happen to be, let's say, uh, a black person in the United States of America. And society is constantly discriminating you. Or you happen to be uh, a homosexual in a, in a country like India. And society is just constantly, you know, keeping you at bay, you know, discriminating you, not allowing you. You understand? So the person is not mental and physically uh, diseased. It's okay. But society is making it, so the so, its social well-being is compromised, right? You understand? Yes, sir. So that will ultimately lead to affecting its mental and physical health as well. Because a person will not feel good uh, after discrimination. No one will feel good after discrimination, right? And about emotional also. If you are too emotional about something, if you, if you cry very, very, like if you start crying at every instance, anything that happens and you start crying, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, that's also not good. You should be balanced in terms of your emotions. If you are short tempered, that's not mental health issue. That's your emotional um, health issue. That anyone says anything which is which you don't want to hear, you are so, so short tempered that you end up yelling at them or you end up you know, saying that shut, shut up or don't talk to me like this. I don't want you to hear opinions. That that's all comes under your emotional well-being okay you should have some emotional tolerance if that increases and it has some reasons clinical reasons then it becomes mental well mental issues and if it is affecting your organs and your body your physical form it becomes physical health issue and if everything is fine but you are somehow not feeling good and happy and and uh, safe among in the society you are living that comes into your social uh, issues, social health issues, social, social well-being. Is it clear to everyone? Anna, Atef, Anna, does it answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay, very well. So you understand the differences now? You respect the boundaries now? Yes, sir. Perfect. So health is clear. Now let's come to diseases then. 
So all of these can have diseases, can, can go wrong. And what are diseases? And what are disorders? Some fundamentals. I think today we'll be covering some fundamentals only. Then I come to the details. So what is a disease? As the term suggests, dis-ease. Look at the term whenever you are confused. Dis-ease. What does ease means? Ease means comfort. Right? Are you at ease? Are you at comfort? Right? We use this. Dis-ease means not at comfort. Is it clear? Yes. Sir. Is it clear, everyone? Yes. Similarly, disorder. What does order mean? Proper regulation, right? Is order. Yes. Sir. If it is disease, not a proper regulation is disorder. So disease and disorder have a very fine line difference. For example, you must have heard of the, uh, the, the something called uh, uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, right? OCD. Yes, sir. So they are compelled to, so, you know, everything should be right in the place. Everything should be clean. If the OCD goes beyond a point, if a person washes their hand, you know, OCD is kind of a mental, um, not uh, not being mentally well, because if they're cleaning something, you know, they're not able to feel that it is clean. So they will keep cleaning their, if they're washing, they will keep washing their hands for a very long time. And anything that moves in their room, they will just stop everything and come back and arrange it in the same manner. So it has, it has a gradation of stages, how severe it is or how, at, at, I think at the base level, all of us have some or the other kind of compulsion, but it's not a disorder. We all would like that our book stays in one place, right? Yes. Yes. So we are obsessed for, our, for it. We all are obsessed by our looks, by the way, right? We, whenever we go out of the house, I'm sure that none of us, including me, myself, we look that how do we, we look in the mirror, how do we look, right? And if we do not have a mirror, we'll find a mirror. If we do not have a mirror, we'll take a selfie and look at how do we look? Is my hair looking fine or is it just everywhere around? There are also people who do not care. No, I don't care about my hair. That's fine. But looking at yourself on a daily basis is not a disorder. But if you keep doing that every second minute, and before that, you will not feel confident. That's a OCD. That becomes a disorder now. So are you understanding these fine lines? I think this discussion, is it helping you to understand certain fundamentals of disease and health? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. So write down. Write down. Anything. Any any factor, sorry, any factor that affects the well-being condition, that affect the well-being condition including the physical well-being, mental well-being, including the physical and mental well-being. So could you repeat that? Anything that affects the well-being condition including the physical and mental well-being leads to diseases and disorders leads to diseases and disorders now we will stick to physical diseases now we will not talk about mental emotional and social part now so we'll stick to physical for your syllabus so tell me, with respect to physical diseases and physical disorders, what are the factors that can cause diseases and disorders? Pathogen. Very good. Factors affecting health. Or factors causing diseases and disorders. So one is, yes, yes, uh, just one minute. So one is, Atif said, pathogens. What are pathogens, Atif? What do pathogens do? Yes, uh, they are microorgan microorganisms that uh, cause diseases in uh, other organisms. But what do they do? Where do they begin from? What, what, how do they function? What do they do? 
they create yes. infection in the body, right? Yes, sir. Every pathogen starts with infections. So that's where infections are a kind of diseases that start with infections. So pathogen causes infection. And yes, Hannah, you were saying something. What other factors can affect? Okay. If some disease is not happening by pathogens and infections, how else it can happen? Yes. So I was uh, asking, could you repeat the... Uh, Anything that affects the well-being of a person, That's including right. physical and mental well-being, leads to diseases and disorders. Leads to diseases and disorders. And then we came come to then we came to factors affecting health. Pathogens are one. Quickly, what is the others? Viruses. Viruses are, they can come in, they also cause infection in our body, right? Yeah. They are pathogens only. Now, we are not going to name bacteria, viruses, fungus, prions, other small amoeba, plasmodium. They all come under the same. Yes. Apart from it. They're not maintaining a good lifestyle. Yes. Lifestyle is all other big factor so lifestyle related diseases can you name one disease like this like for pathogens we know that uh, i can say tuberculosis right or i can say typhoid or i can say covid or lifestyle related diseases Sir, I'm not sure if this is a disease, but can you say obesity? Yes, it is. Obesity. Yes. And? Sir, if a person has um, smoking or drinking problem, in probably uh, due to smoking, he might... Uh... Drug, drug abuse leading to cancers and other neurological problems, right? You are correct. Parkinson's and all this. Yes, you're right. And deficiencies that happens, right? Deficiency disorders. Sir, like, um, like if a person is not, more in yeah. of uh, cigarettes can cause lung problems. Yes, exactly. So that also comes under lifestyle. That comes under drug abuse, I've written, right? Yes, sir. Cigarette is a drug, you abuse it, you know? Yes, sir. You can actually only abuse cigarette. You can never use it for good reason. So that's there. Deficiency disorders. Like if you're not getting proper food, if you're not getting proper ventilation, your, your lifestyle is so hectic uh, that your eating habits have changed, you're resting, if you're not getting enough sleep. Lack of sleep also causes diseases. One such disease where you cannot sleep is called insomnia and uh, insomnia can start causing other physical problems so, but and insomnia a mental disorder insomnia is not like it's a men uh, it, it sometimes can have more robust reasons which are physiological reasons it could be genetical genetic reasons as well for insomnia or it can also be elicited by lifestyle. If you, that's why you should get proper sleep. If you, if you always misuse your system and not give it proper sleep, the system becomes uh, disturbed. Okay. Okay, sir. Yeah, but it's not. It's not a mental health. Insomnia is one of the symptoms in many mental health issues. Like when someone is uh, under severe anxiety, they cannot sleep well. They cannot sleep at all sometimes because they always feel the panic. They always feel if I'll sleep, someone is going to kill me or something like that. They constantly are in a, uh, they are in a, in a state of anxiety so they cannot sleep. When you're anxious, actually that is the purpose of being anxious so that you do not sleep in your exam. So that's why your, our body keeps a basal level of anxiousness in the system so that we, we perform good. Okay? And just like that. 
third one which you are not coming up to is genetic disorders okay this is the last so genetic disorders you know what are genetic disorders where there is a mutation we studied this in chapter 6 right chapter 5 and 6 yes genetic diseases what are genetic disorders defects with which genetic mutations with which a child is born with genetic disorders are always by birth are born can we give him some examples of genetic disorders you have studied lot of it color blindness thalassemia sickle cell anemia right yes so these are the major down yes down syndrome tau syndrome they are chromosomal disorders yes very well so majorly these are the factors so pathogens give rise to infectious diseases they are communicable infectious diseases they can be communicated from one person affected to other lifestyle related and genetic disorders may not be infectious so they are called non infectious or non communicable like cancer can also be genetic right due to a mutation in the in the cell so they are non infectious they cannot spread a cancer cannot spread from one person to another just by being in the vicinity but covid or, or tuberculosis or typhoid can yes atif yes sir not all diseases by pathogens are infectious right yes right depends where the infection is happening correct so if they are just acting as like internally and mostly the pathogens that affect your body uh, your lungs and can be transferred through body fluids causes this problem so we'll talk about it in